Hello everyone, uh, today we'll discuss the philosophical essay on priorities by Pierre-Simon Laplace. This is a very important essay uh, because it brings together the theory of probabilities and uh, uh, unexpected connections with moral philosophy, ethics, epistemology, the way of thinking correctly, etc. And the, the reason why we picked this, uh, the, the anecdote why we picked this text to read actually was um, that a few weeks ago the, the statistics community had, um, had a controversy whether, whether to rename uh, 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 an award, an important award in statistics called after Ronald Fisher. And people were protesting since Fisher had some eugenistic and, and, and racist views. And um, I, I was personally wondering, uh, so, so, so some people argued that uh, Fisher in the, in the early 20th century was a man of his epoch, etc. And so I was just, personally, I was just thinking that um, there are many thinkers who um, who had views that are not necessarily based on the 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 generally held opinion of their epoch or of their culture or of their region, etc. And I thought of Laplace because uh, he wrote this essay, and I just went to the essay and and searched for for keywords uh, related to to race or slavery, etc. And and found out that that Laplace was arguing that. Um, commonality and frequently held beliefs, so if something is commonly held or frequently held, that's not a valid moral or epistemic uh, argument. And um, I was personally aware of the process, uh, thanks to Lay, but uh, didn't, uh, didn't read the last edition of it until recently. And, uh, and it's interesting in the context of our reading group, because um, as I said, so um, it discusses uh, at least the three, ch the three chapters we'll discuss today are applications of probability theory to moral philosophy, something that is highly important in the context of AI ethics in particular. The second part we'll discuss is the, the application of probability theory in, in, uh, in the judgments um, um, made in a court. And the, the last part we'll discuss um, is what Laplace called on illusions in estimating probabilities or in what 20th century psychologists would call probably cognitive biases. Yeah, maybe I can even or uh, backtrack a little bit and uh, explain the, the context a bit of, uh, of this essay. Uh, so uh, a bit of the history of the power of poverty theory uh, essay. Uh, so poverty theory was uh, like probably really started uh, around the 17th century with people like La La uh, with uh, like Fermat or, or Pascal. Um, and and then de Moivre, from Bernoulli, de, de Moivre, and, and so on. Uh, but uh, before Laplace, like most of the probability theories were in a sense deductive, uh, meaning that we had a, an initial source of probability, and then we tried to see the consequences of this uh, initial source of probability. Uh, so you start with axioms, which are the, the axioms of probability. Uh, typically, heads or tails would be one half and half, and then you compute the, the consequences of all of this. Uh, and in 1776, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, uh, like, uh, so, so there was this guy, Thomas Bates, who did uh, some work uh, in the meantime in England, but it was like he did not publish it. Uh, it was, he did not really believe it. Uh, in, in any case, like the, the, the most fundamental work, initial work on, on inductive probability theory was by uh, Pierre Simon Laplace in 1776. Uh, and he basically put forward like what we know today as base rule, as this uh, rule to go from the observations, the data, uh, so go to go from this to uh, general theories, for instance, uh, to, to infer the laws of the universe from the observations that we make. Which, which if, if my understanding is correct, Bayes did that as an attempt to answer Hume's induction problem. Uh, so, so Bayes, so it's not, well, yeah, so it's related to, to a primary, uh, by, by Hume, so David Hume, uh, so this philosopher uh, at the beginning of the 18th century, so like a few decades before Laplace and, and, and Bayes, and uh, Hume asks this question, like, if you see the, the sun rise uh, every morning, uh, is it sufficient to say that it will rise every morning uh, from, from now on? Uh, like is it generalization uh, uh, like a, a, a rule, uh, something that you can uh, that, that you can uh, yeah? Is it uh, a good way to think? 
And uh, Hume already had this intuition that no, it's not like exactly the right way to think. Instead, we should think in terms of probability. Like the fact that we observe the, the, the sun rising every morning increases the probability that it will be rising tomorrow. But Hume did not take this further, like he did not formalize uh, th this idea. He did not uh, relate this to the mathematics of, of probability theory. Uh, Bayes did uh, part of this work, but Laplace did, mo did most of the work. And uh, especially Laplace not only like solved this, this kind of small problem, I'd say, but he generalized this and he, he had this very, uh, very bold claim and this essay philosophic, uh, this philosophical essay from 1814, uh, the first edition, and then 1840, uh, the second edition, uh, is really like the, the, the philosophical approach to probability. Like, the, like his 1776 essay was, uh, memoir was more like mathematical, though it has a bit of philosophy, of course, but it was more uh, mathematical. And then Laplace taught this probability course at the Ecole Polytechnique uh, in France, uh, um, after well, in the late 18th century, uh, but probably he felt that people were too uh, stuck too much in the mathematics and did not really see the philosophical uh, uh, importance of this work, and that's probably why he, he wrote this uh, this essay. Uh, and I think this essay is absolutely fantastic. I think this is the. Yeah, I'm not going to make a lot of friends by saying this, but I think this is the best uh, philosophical essay ever written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so uh, in this essay, like he, well, he, he does discuss a little bit of the mathematics of probability, but uh, the main point is that um, there's this thing he calls uh, good judgment, bon sens in French, uh, and uh, he, he, he kind of argues that this is what uh, bright people are endowed with in some sense maybe but, just like one, one, one important uh, one important precision here about like good judgment and bon sens uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding around that uh, often translated in common sense uh, it's he's, it's not meaning common sense in the term like intuition and the commonly held beliefs actually laplace is writing the last chapter where he mentions like slavery as a commonly held uh, belief that it's okay it's not okay of course uh, actually, he's against common sense. What, what yeah. like, le bon jugement, like good judgment, not uh, common judgment. Yeah. Like, bon jugement. Some people translate it to the bon sens, and then bon sens becomes, which is common sense, and uh, those are radically opposed things. Like it's clear, it's really clear from from especially from the French version that he's meaning good judgment and not common sense. Yeah, and he's arguing against actually common sense and commonly held beliefs. Yeah, yeah, and his point is that you have this oh, so common sense by held by most people. There's this good judgment held by uh, some some well some brighter people, and what he argues is that uh, or like when you think longer, you get closer to the to the good judgment. But what he argues is that good judgment is, is still missing some of uh, the important things. So for one thing, it's not very quantitative. And what he argues is that uh, probability theory is the ultimate way of thinking. Uh, there, there's this quote, like he, he frequently in this essay uh, discusses the fact that uh, good judgment kind of leads us towards the right direction, but uh, the computation of probability theory, the, the calcul des probabilités, so probability calculus, will, is what gets us closer to, makes us appreciate what's uh, the, the, the exact and right way of thinking, uh, in a sense. So the, the essay is a lot about this, and it draws a lot of applications of this uh, very, uh, like very fundamental and general principle, like it's about how to think in general. So of course, it's going to have a lot of applications to all sorts of fields. And uh, those we are going to discuss today uh, are mostly uh, related to uh, moral sciences and and, uh, and, uh, and lawsuits. So let's start about the, this first chapter that we read uh, from the book. So why is uh, why are priorities important in, uh, in discussions about moral, uh, moral philosophy? So the, the main argument of Laplace is simply that the, the world is extremely complex. And even if we 
take a long time to think and have the highest ability to, to provide good judgment. Uh, people will make mistakes at anticipating the effect of uh, written laws on the world. So uh, if we see, for example, that they, there are lots of crimes and we want to, to design a law to reduce the, the amount of crime, it's a, it, it, it can be done, obviously, but it will sometimes have side effects that are unpredictable. And, and that's why Laplace recommends that we should think of doing this kind of uh, transformation of changes, but in terms of uh, thinking about it in terms of probabilities. So simply knowing that the effect of that law is uncertain and what we want is to be able to observe what this law is, uh, how this law is affecting the world and possibly change it if we see that the transformation is not what we expected. And this is, this, this, this will be, this has been very common that laws are, are being changed over time as we see that they, they require improvement. And, uh, one thing he, he discusses in, in this uh, in this section is uh, the fact that um, it's it's often the case that uh, we see uh, maybe part of the law that's never used or that uh, has bad consequences uh, in some points, and you, you may feel like uh, we should remove this part of, of the law. And what Laplace argues is that. Uh, it, it may be uh, dangerous because we, we we not predicting well enough the consequences uh, of of the law, and uh, just so that we understand which parts of the laws are, are important and, and which are, are not, we should not rely solely on on a, on our judgment, but also keep track. Uh, so there's this discussion like it's almost an invitation to do uh, data science or to collect data or to have a good database, uh, to have a data driven. Uh, uh, writing of the law uh, and he, he really encourages uh, people to, to keep track of all of the cases where the law was applied and for which reasons uh, to better understand uh, what, what makes a, a law good. And I think this is um, not necessarily specific to, to, to probability theory, it's more about like the complexity of, of the world. Uh, I think there's a bit of, of a computation complexity uh, theory uh, behind it all. Uh, and uh, and I, I think it, it's, it has a lot of consequences to the way we think about uh, safe algorithms, for instance. But algorithms are supposed to make judgment as well. And maybe part of the algorithm is not going to be used and you, you may want to just keep it because it, it's slow or something like this. Uh, but uh, the way you should be doing this, according to Laplace, is that you should absolutely, uh, absolutely keep track of, of a lot of data and to have a, a data-driven approach to, uh, to designing uh, uh, what a good judgment is. But by the way, I'd just like to keep this discussion accessible. Let's not just mention algorithms because some people think it's something complex. Just decision making procedures, like it, like especially if we're thinking the the era of what has to think of decision making procedures. If you have a procedure to make decisions uh, in a complex world where uh, mo many data are missing and and many phenomena are interdependent in a complex way, in an untractable way, you can't track all the dependencies. Then, then this argument from Laplace hold, it holds especially in the context of decisions made by machines in a, like with lots of data that humans can process. But it, the, the argument is valid in, in, in human judgments, in, 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 in courts, etc. Yeah. yeah. Later, Laplace uh, compares to two ways of taking uh, decisions. Uh, the first one is uh, using your intuition and the best you can do according to your good judgment. And the second one is uh, relying on collected data and uh, writing Sorry. some properties on paper. According to your common sense, not to your good judgment. If you, it's a- uh, Just keep them separate. <laughs> mm -hmm. so according to your, here you mean common sense or your intuition. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it can also be uh, the, the best you can do to achieve good judgment. And, the, the, the second thing to, uh, to, to compare it with is using collected data and writing some computations of probabilities on a, on a piece of paper and coming up with a result. And it's, uh, it's usually a, a difficult effort to make to, to accept that the, the computation done on a piece of paper is more trustful than the 10 minutes you spend thinking about, uh, about an estimation in the general case. Yeah, it's a it's a really a general theme of the of the essay. 
Um, and it, it, it's, um, well, I guess it's a bit more subtle than this because uh, uh, Laplace acknowledges the fact that most of the time you can't reduce things to computation. It's a very frequent uh, uh, concept in, in, the, in, in the essay. Like he often says that we should try to reduce things to computation, but sometimes uh, things are too complicated to be, for uh, the soumettre calcul to be, to be submitted to the computations. It's like this computation is like an oracle. Uh, it's like computer you can imagine today. And if you can formalize everything, uh, like the problem to it, then it, it, it will give you an answer. But more often than not, it, like the problem is too complex for you to, to write it down and to ask the computer, what, what do you think? And, and then uh, uh, Laplace argues that in, in this sort of situation, you should then think in terms of, of analogy, but you should be careful about to which extent the analogy uh, holds. Uh, but the, and the analogy that, uh, that Laplace frequently uh, discusses is uh, uh, what he, uh, like having this, uh, this box with balls inside of it, and you don't know what are the balls inside of it. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, he uses the, uh, the, 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 well, the thought experiment of drawing a ball and, uh, for instance, observing that you drew a, a black ball. And then the question of, of, uh, of Laplace is, what is the probability that all of the balls inside are, are black? Or what is the probability that the next ball that you draw is black? And he's using the, this, very, uh, this thought experiment that's very remote from, from, from the law or from everything. Uh, but somehow he... Sees, like he constantly in the essay founds connections between this very thought, very simple thought experiment and actual problems that you face, for instance, in, in the court of law. Uh, so, so one example he, he, he gives uh, in the essay is uh, the example of a testimony. So uh, this is clearly very important uh, in the law uh, to have uh, uh, testimonies. Uh, but there's always the problem of how much you do trust the person who uh, who, who gives a, a testimony, and so uh, uh, well, uh, uh, well, Laplace has all of the, well this very really nice uh, discussion. But essentially, what he says is that um, they are like uh, if some some event is extremely unlikely, uh, a priori, like you, you like for instance, like. Uh, uh, so, so a murder is like very unlikely a priori, like most people don't murder another person. Uh, then um, if somebody tells you that, uh, that there was a murder, what you should compare is the probability a priori of this murder with the probability that uh, the person who, who, uh, the, who, who gives the testimony is uh, either lying or being mistaken. Now, now, this probability of a person lying or being mistaken can be small, but probably like, it has to be very, very, very small to be comparable to the probability of a murder, typically. Uh, and so th this is the kind of probability thinking that, uh, that uh, th this essay is talking a lot about. Uh, and it really answers also like some of the questions that, that uh, David Hume uh, raised uh, earlier in the, in the century. Yeah, a famous quote mentioned about this topic is that uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah, and this is something you can read if you if you look closely at the Bayes rule, where the yeah. how much the probability you assign to some theories and uh, some unknown theory will change is dependent on the probability of the observation. And if you make extremely unlikely observations, it will change more the how much you, your, your beliefs in different theories. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another uh, uh, very interesting aspect of uh, probability theory applied to, to, the, to the context of the law is uh, the fact that when we write the law, like most laws are written as uh, if the person is guilty, then uh, do something. And if the person is not guilty, then do not well, do something else. Uh, and this kinds of, of, uh, of, of principle, of, of rule, this kind of uh, algorithm, uh, requires perfect knowledge of uh, the, whether the person is guilty or not. Uh, and yet, in practice, uh, we, we have to expect that we're only going to have limited data. We're not going to be able to have a mathematical proof of the fact that person, the person is guilty or not. We only have evidence, we only have data that will uh, 
uh, change what we believe that will update our, our probabilities. But there may, and quite often, there is still a huge amount of uncertainty when the sentence has to be given. And so what Laplace argues is that the, the law, we should think more of the law as, or we should write more of the law, or maybe not write because it's difficult, but we should think at least of the law as more something like, if the person has a high probability, a probability larger than 99% of, or 90%, percent let's say, of being guilty, then we should give him this sentence. And maybe we can then have uh, different levels of, of sentences depending on this probability. If the probability is between 50% and 90%, we have also a harsh, uh, harsh uh, ruling, but not as harsh as it is uh, as if it were larger than 90%. Another another illustration was just like the introductory paragraph of the, the application of probabilities to 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 to, to the law, uh, and the, and and the, the court ruling. Uh, just the, the 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 fact that we have this uh, first instance, like the first tribunal, and then you have the appeal, and then in the appeal you go to a, a tribunal, and like Alpas argues that in the appeal you need more judges. And you need the majority vote, etc., because like the probability that, that an error was made in the first. Uh, so, so just like the uh, this in, in terms of probability thinking, uh, this would just boil down to to the wisdom of the crowd, like wisdom of the crowd, but not every crowd, the crowd of judges. And yeah. Then he's making a, a probabilistic argument for the fact that if you go to appeal, you, you need to increase the level, the the, the, the number of judges uh, before you 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 finish the, the procedure. Yeah, and there's and to, also to go back to the to go back to the threshold that uh, that Leo was discussing about the fact that we can't be absolutely certain that someone is guilty, but we should uh, still send that person to jail if there is a high probability that that person is guilty. This this sounds quite hopeful because it means that with some frequency we are going to to put some innocent people in jail, mm. and some some something else that is not desirable is that we we release free. Some uh, some some murderers that would kill other people. So there is this balance between a several undesirable outcome, and because the system is not perfect, and we can't have a perfect knowledge. So these algorithms should 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 not even try to rely on a, on perfect uh, perfect knowledge. Then we we have to to accept that the the system is going to make mistakes. We can think of it as a, we can do our best to improve it, but. There will be some mistakes, and choosing this this probability of how sure do we need to be to send someone in jail, it will be a balance between the undesirable effects of uh, of putting innocent people to jail and the undesirable effect of releasing a murderer free. Again, just I'm just adding adding just a nuance here. Uh, so Laplace is not saying that like in all cases it will be impossible to have close to perfect knowledge. Just arguing that in many cases perfect knowledge is hard, so we have to have. So then we go to appeal, etc. But then he says, like in, in easy cases where it is easy to establish close to certain, like like everyone in the village saw this person murder this person, and, and like <laughs> even the judge saw the the killer kill the victim. Then you don't need to go to appeal. You don't need to do this sophisticated probabilistic thinking. Like just like just to to close the door because sometimes when we we bring in relativism like this one that like we can't always know perfectly etc. Some people interpret it in the wrong way and say okay then everything is relative. We can never know. Uh, no no like Laplace is not closing the door to the easy cases. There are easy cases and in these easy cases the simple almost binary way of thinking is practical. And this is enough. So we're not ruling out uh, simple and close to binary thinking. It's just that in complex cases where it is clear that no one has complex, like everyone has only partial knowledge. And for example, evidence has been destroyed, for example, like the, the, the evidence was destroyed either by the, the guilty person or the likely guilty person or by someone who would like, someone who is really guilty and would like to, to make the, the accused person look guilty. So, for example, those cases, those are complex cases where we need this relativistic thinking, probabilistic thinking, go to appeal, increase the number of judges. Laplace is not ruling out. Uh, so, so Laplace is not a uh, relativist, relativist for the sake of being relativist. And sometimes I read 
uh, in some part of the literature, like people using Laplace uh, reasoning to say that, okay, knowledge of truth is always relative and it's like, and then they rule out close to certainty cases. Like there are cases yeah. close to certainty is useful. I agree that it's a, a common mistake and uh, it's, it's good to, to mention it. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, this, this mistake is described with the, with the image that uh, people think in black and white, so absolute certainty of false, absolute certainty of true, and this is a, this is a wrong way to, to 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 think, obviously. But then when when they realize that oh, nothing is either black or white, things are gray, mm -hmm. they make the mistake of having only one shade of gray. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, thinking in terms of priorities, you should make your priorities go from uh, as close to zero as possible to as close to one as possible, obviously, in many cases, but also have priorities in the middle in for difficult cases that are uncertain. Yeah. And so you should think of all, you should think with all the shades of gray from uh, white as close to one as possible and as close to black, zero as possible. Uh, very dark gray for things that are extremely likely to be false. Yeah, there, there's some very nice quote in, in the essay, uh, it's early on in the essay where he discusses uh, uh, the fact that prob what, what is probability theory, uh, or maybe we can have another episode on this, but what, what is a probability? But uh, essentially what he says is that a probability is a description of our ignorance and of our knowledge. So uh, I, it's really yeah, both. <laughs> where we will discuss the introductory part of the book. So. Uh, it's counterintuitive now we're discussing the, the final part of the book, the final part of the book, so moral philosophy, or law, etc. That we will go back and discuss the introductory part of the book, why probability theory matters. Yeah. But, but just like to close this to close this part on, on relativism, so just like to make it short, um, we like there is a lot of literature on the confrontation between binary thinking and relativism. Uh, and actually probability probabilistic thinking uses both, like there are cases where it's useful to be a relativist and to have nuances and to to defer your judgment and delay it, the, to, like to delay it as, 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 as long as possible. And there are cases where it's very useful and practical and, and, and fair to have close to binary thinking. So you should not rule binary thinking when it's useful and you should be aware that you should be, like you should not use it always and you should be aware that complex cases uh, 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 do not like are not solved by binary thinking. Yeah, yeah, uh, and so just to, to close the 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 section on uh, on the law, uh, there's also a nice discussion about. Um, so so let's say what we care about is actually uh, this probability of the person being guilty, and we want to make sure that it's larger than some high threshold. Uh, so that we can convict uh, uh, the the suspect, uh, and and then Laplace has this discussion about if you grow the size of the assembly of the number of judges to 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 give the the ruling, um, like it sh should you demand that a larger fraction of these or a smaller fraction of these? Well, what is the fraction of these that need to 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 say that that the person is guilty, so that we conclude that the person is indeed guilty, and. Uh, it, well, it, it, this nice question, like if you have a, a very threshold that's very close to one half, uh, then uh, uh, then if you have a small number of judges, then it, it, it's very, very bad. Uh, but essentially what, what uh, uh, the conclusion that Laplace uh, comes to is that uh, with a rough uh, estimate uh, is that uh, out of an assembly of 12 people, maybe there should be something like nine judges that uh, say that the person is guilty in order to convict the the, uh, the individual, uh, and I, I think it's it's a nice um, way of framing the problem. Like you, you demand more than the majority, not because um, uh, not because uh, well that's uh, an arbitrary rule, but because you want to have a high probability to we want to convict the person only if there's a high probability that the person is guilty. I think it's a, it's a nice way of, of thinking about this problem. Yeah, and it's also, it's also the, the fact of accepting that mistake can be made, that the jury will not be perfect. If the jury is perfect, either 12 will always agree, or uh, yeah. 12, the, the 12 will always agree because they are perfect. But they are, this is not the case. So in the model that Laplace uh, uh, discusses, the, in the model that Laplace discusses, uh, 
the jury are considered to be quite good, better than chance at, at, uh, at deciding if someone is guilty or not. Maybe they, they get it right with a priority of uh, 75%. Something like this, and this is how uh, Laplace run these computations. Yeah. Now, one caveat to uh, Laplace's computation is that uh, Laplace uh, assumes in his model that uh, the 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 members of the of the of the jury are independent, like the opinions they have are independent. And uh, unfortunately, we know by now that uh, there's a lot of uh, of of correlation of uh, of group polarization effects. When you have an assembly, uh, so this is uh, a caveat to be given to to, to this analysis of, of Laplace, which would demand maybe uh, even larger. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's a complicated problem. Uh, and yes, and it, it, even if the jury will not uh, polarize or have biases because they they are shown the same data, it's uh, surprising to expect that they would be they would make independent judgments. So one of the last sections of, of, of the essay is just called uh, on the illusions in estimating probabilities. And uh, it's, uh, well, it's absolutely fantastic. Like it's uh, like 200 years ahead of its time, uh, uh, essentially. Uh, well, he, 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 he discusses the way people think poorly. I, I guess that, that other philosophers have noticed that people were not always thinking very, very clearly. But what's really nice is that now that he has this uh, postulate that poverty theory, is, poverty theory is the right way of thinking, then you can measure how people deviate from this right way of thinking. And uh, in doing so, like he, he, he discusses essentially all the, 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 the best known uh, cognitive biases that we, we know of today. Uh, like, for instance, uh, the better fallacy is like if you only see a stream of uh, like uh, no, no, if you see a lot of uh, of uh, of uh, red uh, co coming up uh, in the in the roulette in in casino uh, lately, then you might be tempted to say, well, the next one is not going to be red because it's come too often, something like this. Uh, but uh, Laplace argues that this is uh, uh, an illusion. Uh, and then he discusses things that are probably closer to what we would known as call today uh, cognitive bias, like familiarity bias, motivated reasoning. I think these are the two main that he he really stresses uh, in this essay, uh, and uh, he does this in a very very compelling way. So uh, I think this is really really uh, very fascinating section. Okay. Yeah, one point that I that I that I like to write is that uh, uh, usually people underestimate how much of what they observe in the world happens simply due to, to randomness. So with the yeah. example of the, of the lottery, uh, a lot of people try to find out explanations of why this, num this number came out. And one of the explanation is that some numbers come, uh, uh, did, the number 47 didn't come for, for two years and it, it's bound to happen at some point. So we, we bet on this one. Other sort of explanation is that there are people that would log all the numbers that come out of the lottery and find the numbers that come the most often, and then try to bet on these numbers because they have been observed to come more often. But but uh, and Laplace discusses that he simply uh, created a small model of uh, of generating uh, lottery numbers and finds out that yes, we expect that in. If you if you observe past data, there will be some numbers that came out more than others. It's a it's a normal thing simply due to to the random process, and because you find such a simple explanation, uh, uniformly random randomly generated numbers to to explain what have been observed, uh, one should not think that they, there is a different processes for generating these numbers than the simple process that Laplace. Uh, that, that, that Laplace described and that builds actually the lottery. Yeah, and it's related to this idea of uh, what poker players call uh, resulting bias. Uh, so that's like judging uh, the decision of someone, like uh, like whether he was right to play number five in, in the lottery uh, based on the result. And you say, oh, I was stupid, I did not play five, <laughs> the, the number five, for instance. Uh, and a uh, poker player would, would say that uh, this is a very, 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 very bad habit at least in poker, because he, he, you you give too much attention to things that are, are just noise, 
and you're going to update your strategy based on this and you, you're not going to, to focus enough on, on your decision making because this is what matters, decision making. So typically in, in, in poker players, professional poker players, uh, there, there are these groups of, of, of poker players who, who just never discuss like the so-called bad beats, the way they, they, they lost in a, in, a, in a tournament, like the, the specific hand they lost on, even though it was highly uh, unlucky. Uh, because what they care about is like the decision making, what it is that you choose to do when you had this uncertainty. And based on this uncertainty, what, whether what you did was good or not, and not based on the result. Like you should judge based on the uncertainty and not based on the result. I think this was one of the. This is one of the the, the, the greatest insights of uh, of cognitive theory. Uh. Yeah, and, and this is very hard to do in practice. I often uh, reward reward myself for making decisions that ended up doing good, and uh, to punish myself for making decisions that ended up being bad. And 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 I learned because of the result. And uh, today it's hard to to do differently. Yeah. But still, uh, think about so. To, to illustrate this with the, the example of, uh, of Lottery. Lottery is well known to be a game with a negative utility, neg negative uh, expectation of, uh, of, of gains. So if you judge a decision process that either decides to play the lottery or not, it's, it's very easy to, to, to agree right now that the, the decision process that decide to play is making wrong decisions when the decision process that decide not to play is making correct decisions. But now, if you if you imagine you see someone that decided to play and won, then it it is very unintuitive to say that the, the decision to play for for that person who won was a, a wrong decision, a decision pushed by a, a decision process that does not correctly maximize its expected utility, it's simply because of the result. And uh, and this can lead to, to to difficult discussion if you discuss with someone, they, they might tell you. You don't know whether I'm making a, a good or not decisions because we haven't seen the result yet. Yeah, yeah, that's not probabilistic <laughs> thinking at all. <laughs> like, let's talk about the value, like uh, confirmation bias. Yeah. So confirmation bias and the example of Leibniz. So uh, there are like I don't know if like the audience is familiar with like some uh beliefs like in numerology like people who believe in like the power of numbers if this number pops out and then there's i don't know if the the the, the golden ratio uh, in something then there's something special about these objects and um this is something still common in these days people people like uh, like uh, be believe in, in in miracles just because some, some sequence of numbers appeared I don't know, in the date of birth of some singer and then the date of release of the, her album of, or, or his album. And then they will start like building up theories and the internet is very good in amplifying these theories that because the, the date of birth of the singer and her date of release of the album and then I don't know, 9-11 appear like happened and then you, the ratio between two. So, so this, is, this is something that sounds funny. But even great minds uh, were not uh, immune to it. And he, he gives the example of Leibniz and, um, and, and Bernoulli also. Uh, and also, sorry, no, but like mostly Leibniz. Like the Bernoulli and Leibniz computed this theory, like a series of numbers that gives some, some special results, etc., uh, done by Bernoulli and Leibniz. But Leibniz used this result to argue with the Chinese emperor that God exists. So God might exist for other reasons, but not because the series is equal to one over two. Or so he's like he 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 he, he so Leibniz, who was a strong believer, uh, knew that the Chinese emperor loves mathematics. So he thought like yeah maybe like uh, this this will convince him of like Christian God and Christianity and and then he sent him like a, a funny note on the results of a series and said look. If you sum these numbers and then you obtain one over two or one or one over four, right? one over two, right? One over, yeah, I think it was one over two. Yeah, one over yeah, two. One, two. One over two, and then look, this this like you create something out of nothing, and this is, uh, this is how God operates, and this is a proof. Uh, uh, and Laplace argues that like this, 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 like Laplace does not call it confirmation bias, but today, in light of what we know since the 20th century, all the work on, on, on cognitive biases, this is a clear instance of cognitive bias. You believe something is, is true, so you believe God exists, you believe in Christianity or 
Islam or Judaism or whatever. So, and then you have a strong bias towards confirming, like validating everything that comes from your religion or your ideology, communism or capitalism or whatever you want. And, and then he goes on with, with examples like that. And so but I, I believe this, this, this chapter on the illusions of computing probabilities, if, if you want to rename it today, in light of, of the developments we had in psychology, it can be called uncognitive biases, actually. Like you can you can argue that what he calls illusions in computing probabilities are cognitive biases, actually. So, and that's also, so I mentioned this, uh, so the confirmation bias and the case of Leibniz, who practice, like who's almost fall into numerology to argue for a Christian God. Um, uh, but then uh, there is the, the, the other example, which might be, uh, uh, I don't know, a hybrid between confirmation bias and familiarity bias, maybe more like familiarity bias in, in, in modern terms, which is this, this, this the thing that uh, it's not because slavery is commonly accepted that it is okay. So, and it's, it's not like, it's not because in some culture, some practice is commonly accepted then this practice is morally good. So, so maybe we can even argue from this chapter that as, as people who, who learn probability theory, we have a moral duty to go beyond the commonly held moral standards of our culture, of our time, of our era, of our, I don't know, region. Or, and, and then, for example, like, uh, like you mentioned slavery, but we can, we can go on, make a, make a case for like just moral progress, for example, like moral progress is a debate in like moral progress versus um, moral relativism. So um, uh, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm exact, but uh, like in, in moral relativism, people would tend to tell you like you have to respect the moral standards of some culture or some region, etc. Uh, for example, let's say like there is a region where people don't let girls to school, for example. Like sh should should you respect should you respect this practice because it is a it is the commonly held moral standard of of that region or or should you like should you try to go beyond that and and the the, the if you read the the, the chapter of Lapsa, of Laplace you, you can come up I personally came up with the conclusion that when you when you learn probability theory you have to work with it and think with it and think harder and try to always go beyond uh, the commonly held moral standards of your time and of your, of your group, of your social group, whatever that social group. Yeah, uh, yeah. so the, the connection with probability theory may be uh, a bit loose in the, in, the, in the essay itself. I think it's more like a point that, uh, well, th these are cognitive biases that people have. But, um, and I don't think Laplace knew about this, but, but there are actually a strong connection with probability theory. So, on the confirmation bias, for instance, uh, problem, there's actually a theorem in, in, uh, in, in Bayesianism that says that uh, uh, the expectation of the posterior is equal to the prior. So you, you should, before looking at the data, you should expect to have in average the same opinion after looking at the data than prior to looking at the data. Uh, and intuitively, the reason for this is that uh, uh, like the data can make you go both ways. Uh, like if you're surprised that the data uh, is suggesting something like, like say like you, you assign a probability one half of uh, Trump being reelected, I don't know, something like this. Then, and then you, you, you expect that tomorrow you're going to have the same opinion. And tomorrow at the end of the day, is going to be probability one half as well. But this may evolve. It's not going to be uh, exactly one half for sure. You don't get to see a tumor. And if tomorrow you see data that suggests that actually the, the, popular of, the popularity of Trump is, is decreasing uh, more than you expected, then you should decrease your probability. But if you're surprised that it's maybe it's decreasing, but not as much as you expected, then you should increase your probability uh, about the, the election of Trump. Uh, so whatever happens, in average, you should have the same. So that's uh, actually a theorem in Bayesianism. Just just to make the connection with poverty theory uh, even less loose. So for example, uh, uh, the, what Louis said, like many things are just due to, just to randomness and, and, and the, like, the, you don't need sophisticated theory to explain them. 
uh, you can you can see that as, as some form of Occam's razor. So you, you don't need sophisticated explanations. Like it's not because um, uh, it's not because uh, the the moon is like that, and the number of girls who were born that month, and the number of bo or boys who were born that month, and the date of birth of of your husband or your wife is like that. That you would have a girl or a boy. Like, you would have a girl or a boy just out of probably randomness, genetic randomness, and uh, how many how many Y chromosomes uh, the, the 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 husband produces and and etc. And it has nothing to do with the moon and the numerology and sophisticated computation of astrology, etc. Uh, and, and like uh, Lay in his book makes a very good case for Occam's razor with probabilistic thinking. So Laplace in in, in Laplace in Laplace writing, the, the connection is not straightforward. But we can argue that um, many of the illusions he talks about, Laplace talks about. Are, some of them are due to uh, a bad application of Occam's razor. So Occam's razor is this principle in epistemology that tells you that uh, out of many explanations, you should always favor the, the simplest one, the, the, the shortest one, the one that does not require a lot of additional assumptions. And like in, in the case of the illusions uh, Laplace is mentioning, a lot of these illusions involve additional assumptions, like the moon and astrology or whatever, neurology and the number of girls and boys that were born that month, and I don't know the, the, the existence of Christian God. So, so those are like unnecessary adopt, uh, assumptions. And Laplace is very well known for actually uh, uh, he, uh, uh, his way of practicing Occam's razor. So, in his book on uh, Mechanic Celeste, right? The, uh, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember the title, but yeah. Yeah, me mechanic like like um, the celestial body motions of the body. Yeah, motion of celestial bodies. There was this famous uh, famous argument he had with Napoleon. With Na Napoleon would tell him, "I don't see any mention of God in your book," and then Laplace just replies, or is believed to have replied, "Sir, sir I just didn't need this assumption." Hypothesis. So this is an instance of Occam's razor, and. and we in this group argue that Ogham's razor is just another way of being the union. Well, it's a component. It's not uh, sufficient. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah there, is still, uh, there, there is still something important to note concerning uh, confirmation biases. So even though you, you, you might have a correct prior and uh, apply Ogham razor quite well, confirmation bias is something that happens at the moment where you, you look at evidence. And the problem is that Sometimes people would look at evidence and no matter what is the evidence, they would change their belief in the same direction, yeah. which is uh, what cannot happen because as they said, that uh, when you look at the evidence in average, depending on what the evidence is, your, your, your change of belief should, should serve up to zero in average. So that means that if the evidence points one way, you should change your belief one way. And if it points the other way, you should change your belief in the other way. Uh, a famous illustrative example for this was the the condemnation of, uh, of Dreyfus, who was accused of, uh, of something. And when people looked for proofs about this, mm -hmm. they, could find no, they could find no proof. And uh, unfortunately, uh, out of finding no proof, they concluded that, oh, yes, he was guilty and good at hiding that he's guilty. So, so I, I, excellent. That, that's an excellent uh, example. I, let's, let's elaborate on this example, maybe to conclude. So just to, to put more context uh, to the English speaking audience. So Alfred Dreyfus was a captain in the French army, and uh, he was good. And the atmosphere was 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 uh, was uh, so back then in France was uh, quite anti-Semitic. So in an anti-Semitic context, Alfred Dreyfus was uh, accused of intelligence, so of of being a spy, a German spy or an English spy, a German spy. I'm guessing German, yeah. A German spy. And the evidence against him was a note uh, that was presented as a note Dreyfus writes to the Germans, so called. And, and then Poincaré, so Henri Poincaré, the polymath, one of the latest, last polymaths, as people say, used a probabilistic arguments to 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 uh, to prove the innocence or to argue for the innocence of, of Dreyfus. If if you found no proof. And then you change your belief to, to increasing how much you think that that person is guilty. If you, if you are 
if you correctly apply base law, it means that if you had found proof, you should have updated your belief in a direction that is not guilty. So when you observe A, like, uh, you, you, you make an observation and you update your belief one way, it means that if you had made the opposite observation, you should update your beliefs to, in the opposite direction. And obviously, fi finding proof of someone guilty should increase your beliefs in the direction that this person is guilty. And it means that not finding proof should always make you update your belief in the direction that that person is not guilty, because or at least slightly. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you you are in the in the in the failure of uh, confirmation bias. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, uh, like to distress that this is uh, easy to say in theory. Uh, in practice, it's always harder when you actually present the evidence and you're always trying to find uh, loopholes and, 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 and explanations for why it goes in your direction. So one way to, to better combat this tendency that we all have to, to motivated reasoning is to pre-commit. Um, so, so ideally, we just apply base rule, you just apply uh, the laws of authority. But uh, because we have limited, uh, we have motivated reasoning, one way to, to combat it is to pre-comment, meaning that you're going to say, well, uh, today I believe this. Uh, I believe that Dreyfus has a 70% probability of, uh, of being guilty. Uh, and I know that the, they are going to look into this, uh, this piece of evidence. And I'm going to, 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 to predict what it is. And I'm going to say, well, I, I think that uh, it's going to be something like that. Uh, and if it's, uh, so let's say that, for instance, uh, it's the number of, uh, of messages he sent to some uh, general in, in, the, uh, in Germany, and you say, well, probably he sent uh, like five messages, and you're going to say, well, that's my prediction. And it means that if there are more messages than this, then you're going to increase your probability that he's guilty. But if you're, there are less uh, messages than this, then you're going to decrease it. And you have to... Well, one good way to do is to pre-commit. And so uh, this is more generally a, a good habit of a Bayesian, which is to, to bet. Uh, Bayesianism and, and betting have uh, strong connections uh, historically uh, and, and still today. And uh, betting is good because it forces you to explicit your, your prior and to, to pre-commit and, and to, to verify that you're not going to do uh, motivated reasoning. Uh, and so, yeah, I think this is uh, one of the important takeaway of, of probabilistic thinking. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, totally agree with that uh, advice from Lee. Uh, and another advice I could give that is slightly less good, but uh, maybe easier to do in practice also, is to simply, when you, when you see yourself in the process of uh, updating your beliefs based on evidence, so if you are already doing this, uh, I think it might be useful to to ask yourself the question, how should I update my belief if I had observed the opposite evidence? In that case, you it might help you detect when you are actually lying to yourself and doing confirmation bias, and help you choose in which uh, direction actually the evidence points to. So next week, we will discuss a very important paper, Gender Shades, uh, by Joy Violami uh, and, uh, and uh, the Timnit Gebru. Uh, that paper was important in 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 uh, in showing empirical evidence that facial recognition is biased, uh, and it has strong biases that make it not ready to deploy. And thanks to that paper and the research uh, follow-ups by these two researchers and and a few others, uh, now there is a moratorium on not deploying facial recognition by many companies. So IBM, then Microsoft, and many others follow stated they will not deploy facial recognition and they will not use it, especially for police and military use. Uh, so we'll discuss that paper, the, some of the follow-ups, and, and what, what does it mean for, for today's um, uh, technologies, such as, so we'll focus on facial recognition, but we'll probably discuss other aspects of, of biases that, that, that's, that need more research and, and more work uh, by, by, by people who work on artificial intelligence and, and computer science, and, and moral philosophy, of course. So thank you, and see you next week. Bye. Bye.